Norway, the place of mountains, of fjords, of trees, of landscapes, of oil rigs, <sighs> and great books, hopefully. Hi and welcome to my channel. In this video we're going to talk about 10 Norwegian classic books I want to read. I thought that I'll talk about books that was written before the Second World War ended. I tried making a list of the classic Norwegian books that I want to read. I've also put in a couple of books that I think I have to read. Because what's the point of having a YouTube channel talking about books if you don't sometimes read books that you think you have to read? And what do I know? Maybe they're amazing. I thought I would start out with one of the must read books. And with its almost 1300 pages, this is Kristin Lavansdatter by Sigge Unset. Sigge Unset is maybe one of the most famous Norwegian authors. She got the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1928, especially for the good way she describes the Nordic region during the Middle Ages and her work in that section. Originally, this book was published in three different parts, so in three different books. And maybe it's a bit daunting to start reading this book now because it's all in one piece. But either way, I, I'm going to do it at some point. It looks cooler having read this book than having read three of these, right? Kirsten Lavanstater means Kirsten, her name. Lavanstater also her name, but it means that she is the daughter of Lavrans. It is set in the 14th century. The way people around me describe this book, they say that it's a struggle. And things can only get worse for the main character, or heroine. So woman meets man, man behaves in a bad way, woman is miserable, life is miserable, and the misery never ends. That's my take on the book. And another take on the book is Unset immerses readers in the day-to-day -day life, social conventions and political and religious undercurrents of the period. I don't have great expectations for this book, but it is a Nobel Prize for Literature winner. And of course, Norway has too many of those compared to the rest of the world. So it might not mean too much, but I'll read this book at some point. And if you have tips for how to get through this book, it's much appreciated. I thought maybe I'll read it uh, book by book instead of in one sitting or <laughs> one sitting or in one go, but we'll see. Maybe I've cheated a little bit, or maybe I haven't. I make up the rules myself, so I should know. But the next book are actually two books by the same author, and that's Knut Hamsun's The Hunger and The Growth of the Soil. I'll start off with The Hunger. I recently heard a podcast where they said that there are a couple of authors that you should just say that you've read some time ago. So that was supposed to be very cool. And the first one was Dostoevsky and the second one was Knut Hamsun. So apparently I should already have read this book. I haven't, but I sort of feel this one I have to, but this one I want to read. In part because it's, it's uh, shorter. So Knut Hamsun, also famous, won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1920. And this is actually his debut novel. The book is about a young man crawling the streets of Kristiania, which is now called Oslo, our capital. And he is constantly hungry. He's trying to become a writer, but he doesn't get a lot of work and he doesn't get a lot of food. So it's always hungry. I've heard some people talk about this book as a book that's about to let go of your dreams and just get a job and live the life instead, live your then a little bit more miserable, but then not life again. I don't know what to make of that, but a friend of mine told me that I should read this before I get kids. And then I could pick up this one after I got kids, because they sort of fit each uh, period of your life. Whereas the hunger is about the struggle before you settle in. This is maybe about the way forward. I actually tried reading this a long time ago. As I said earlier, that's a plus, but it should have been uh, finished and that would have been a bigger plus. I think I only read one fourth of the book 
and then was distracted by something, anything. This book is also supposed to be the reason why he got the Nobel Prize. This was published first in 1917 and he got the prize in 1920. The book is about a man that breaks ground in a quite rural place in northern Norway. He sets up there and he's in great touch with nature and he sees challenges just pile up. One could say that the man is tested in this novel with the things he has to deal with and it's said to be Knut Hamsun's homage to nature. Some people also view this as a historical novel because it describes the period of time from when people, most people were doing uh, agricultural tasks to when people became households of money of sorts from the 19th to the 20th century. Time will tell if I view this man as a genius after reading the books. But I felt he belonged on the list. Of course, very, very... I'm not that great at holding books today, so I'll just put it down. Then we go over to the author that actually I have the best impression of after I finished school. And why was that? Well, I was 10 to 15 years old and what else is there to do than think that life sucks? So that's why the next books are from Amalia Skiram, which is known for her depressing writing. So the things I read from Amalia Skiram when I was in school were quite dark. And the more you read, the darker it got. And I really enjoyed that at that time. I don't know what it's like today, but those were mostly short stories. I've never really read one of her novels. I think I'll start with this one first. It's Constance Ring. That's also the name of the main character in the book. This was actually her first published book and she had to publish it herself. And when she published it, people said that this book was too real. So it was a problem that she described the things the way they were. We meet Constance Ring, which is the daughter of a rich man. And she engages in relationships with three different men at this time. So, wow, after so much practice. She marries this man called Ring. And at what I've heard, she is shocked by the erotic reality of the real world. What does that exactly mean? I don't really know. I should say that the book was first published in 1885 and... What happens next in the book is that she wants to get a divorce and we all know what happens to women that wants to get divorced at this time. They are rejected by society and things are dark. And it's not easy getting a divorce at all. I'm looking forward to depressing read number one. Depressing read number two is Shue Gabriel. Shue Gabriel is a man's name. This is the first book in the series of Hellemish Folke, which is people from a very specific place in Norway, in the western part of Norway. This is seen as her breakthrough novel. One of Amalia Skam's strengths as a writer is that she herself has experienced the pain and suffering, which is the topic of many of her books. Many of the writers at that time did not have it as tough as she, and they came from quite privileged families, many of the authors I speak about today as well. So this is one of the things that makes her different. And that's also why her writing hurts so much to read, because she can describe it in a real way. I should also mention that Shugabel is only half of this book, so it's very, very short. So this I know will be read at some point if I continue my reading journey. In this series of books, she describes the people from that specific place. And in this story, we meet Shugabel that has kids and grandkids and if I understand it correctly, this story is mainly about the grandkid that wants to get rid of the family and wants to get away, lose his ties to the place and to his family and to what it is. This book is one of the ones that I really want to read. And it will be interesting to see if life has put me down to Amalia Skam's level. I don't think so. But will I be sadder when I read this book now than I would have been earlier? Who knows? So we're halfway through and I think uh, to sum it up so far, things are quite sad. Not many funny and happy books were written for the time period we are talking about. Next book is a book that keeps on appearing, probably because I've googled it at some point. It's Ferdamini by 
Osmund Olafsson Vinje, published in 1860. Ferdamini just means travel memories or memories from travel or something like that in this book. And it's not actually a fiction book. It's a non-fiction of sorts, sort of something in between. The author describes a walk he did from Oslo to Trondheim to witness the coronation of a king and then almost back again. Kind of a weird thing to do because it's quite the distance, but uh, he got to write for the paper and that's the most important thing. So it's sort of a collection of different types of writings collected into a book and he sort of sees what he sees and describes it on the way. Someone says that he is trying to find the Norwegian spirit of sorts on his way. So I thought that was a very interesting concept and I have little knowledge about how things were in the 1860s around the Norway so that would be an interesting perspective to have. It's also said to describe the politics of the nation and some of the people he meets so it's a good mix. And now from someone who sought out to find the Norwegian spirit to someone who has actually written the lyrics for the national anthem Björn Stanley Björnsson and Synerve Solbakken published in 1857. Björn Stanley Björnsson is a very famous uh, author in Norway and one of our big four or big four without the and he is actually the first Norwegian to win the Nobel Prize for Literature. So we have three and all of those three are on the list. So Björnstein and Björnstein also is on the list maybe because I feel like I have to read him. This is a Bundefortelling or what I like to translate to peasant tale. Bundefortelling is a genre that's very very popular or was very popular in Norway. Telling stories about lives of farmers or peasants. So that's a genre in itself. I don't know if that translates very well, but this is one of those. Even though the book is called Synerva Solbakken, which is a girl's name, it's really about a man or young, young man or boy who falls in love with Synerva Solbakken. He comes from the shadow side and Solbakken is translated as the sun hill. So very direct language. The parents of Synerva doesn't think he is good enough for her. So that's basically it. It's a very short book. Some say it's like a long novella. So that speaks its case for me. When I've read it, I can say I've read something of one of the big fours. So waving flag. In at number eight, we have the coolest title of them all. It's Amtmann Stötte by Camilla Collet. It translates to the district governor's daughters. And this was published in 1854. The reason I think it's cool, I have no idea. I think it sounds like a rock and roll band. I just like the phonetics of the word, I think. I read somewhere that this was the first Norwegian novel that was society critical. I don't know if that's tr the right translation, but critical to the way things are in Norway. Camilla Collet fronted the view that women are supposed to have equal rights in a society where People told women that they weren't to be public figures because then they would have no private life and that was supposedly disastrous. When the book was released people said that the book was too dark and gritty or grim. The book's topic is basically about all the things that women weren't supposed to do but wanted to do and also about if women should marry for love or for reason. And so this might be the most important book of the bunch that I'm talking about today. The book is basically about the district governor's daughters and we see the lives of the eldest daughters told from the youngest daughter and she sees all the things that could have been different. That's the plot told in very short terms. It's difficult as a Norwegian to know which of these authors are known outside of Norway but this next author is one of the most known in Norway at least and maybe the biggest. He's most known for his plays and the next on the list is also a play. It's Per Gunt by Henna Gibson published in 1867. He has so many quotes and one-liners uh, that he will be remembered for a long time. Especially from this play it's a saying that Per you're lying it's something you can say in Norwegian that people would get the reference to. 
and that says something at least. Since it's such a famous play, I thought I'd read a quote instead of butchering it, so... Among the masterpieces of world literature, this early verse drama by the celebrated Norwegian playwright humorously yet profoundly explores the virtue, vices and follies common to all humanity, as represented in the person of Per Gint, a charming but irresponsible young peasant, based on Norwegian folklore and Ibsen's own imaginative inventions. The play relates the ruggish life of the world-wandering Per, who finds wealth and fame but never happiness, although he is redeemed by love in the end. So Per is quite the character and he ends up in a lot of weird and humorous situations. But maybe one of the main reasons why I put uh, this on the list is because later our most famous composer, because we don't have that many, Edvard Grieg, set the tones for the play. I have not yet seen it, so someday I'll have to see it as well. But I thought I'd read it. And now I've saved the best for last, I think. Since I haven't read any of these books, I really can't say, but this is a book that I have huge faith in. And that is The Seed by Tarja Versos, released in 1940. So we've taken a leap forward in time. Tarja Versos is one of the authors on the list I actually have read two books from. And I love them both. The first one, The Birds, and the other one, The Ice Palace. They had a lot of human emotion, which I really enjoyed and touched on some very important topics. But I love them both and this book is also supposed to be very good. If you don't know the author, I've seen some people uh, say that Jon Fosse has a similar style to what uh, Taya Vesos had. So that might be interesting. Both of them write in Norwegian Ninosk. For my sake, who has read both of them, I think that that has a big part in it. But the themes of the book is violence and guilt. A person comes to an island and kills a young girl. And the brother avenges the girl and kills the perpetrator. But then the community gets together with guilt and try to make amends with what has happened. Vesos' graphic evocation of nature and his parallel between the violence of savage animals and humanity makes this a book of unusual literary distinction. He really has an ability to explain how people are feeling, I would say. So this seems very interesting. This is one of the books I'm really looking forward to. So that makes 10. I know that this video shines that I haven't read any of these books and maybe has too little knowledge about Norwegian authors and books, but I hope I sparked some interest for some of these books for you. And now you know which books I'm planning on reading. And I'm hoping to read some of them soon. I at least hope you enjoyed it and comment below if you have suggestions for other classics I should read. And then I hope to see you next time. Bye!